Hey there, I'm Lance and I'm a gamer. And I'm Sam and I'm a non-gamer. And we are Love to Hate, where we help gamers find great games to play with non-gamers. Today we're taking a look at River Valley Glassworks by All Play. River Valley Glassworks. Now this is an interesting game that's going to have sliding river tiles that are going to be translucent, that are gonna have glass pieces on them that are also semi-translucent, uh, that are gonna be in different shapes, different colors, and you'll be drafting these glass pieces from the river to place onto your board. Now the different colors are going to matter because each color has a different degree of rarity from the bag. And so you wanna try to line this up and to which you are able to get seven colors, uh, there are eight total, so you don't want all eight, uh, to fit in each row of your board. And then on top of that, you are trying to make sure that you have the colors that are the most on your board towards the furthest right. That will make much more sense as I show it to you down on the table, but if you can do those two things, you'll maximize your points in this game. And uh, the river is a river and it's gonna be sliding, so these pieces are going to be moving down the river each turn. You'll have to be wise about how you draft them out of the river. Let's go down to the table where I'll show you how this one works and then we'll come back and share our thoughts on it as a gamer and non-gamer. All right, I have River Valley Glassworks on the table. Let me show you all about this drafting and tile placement game. Uh, not really tile placement, more like glass placement as you are going to be placing these little glass pieces onto your player boards. Now, what you have for components, I do wanna make sure that you understand what you see here is the deluxe version of the game. The retail version may look different, may come with different quality components, but what I have for my copy of the game is a game mat that is stretched out right here. You you do have these translucent river pieces that are going to have a number of stones that are going to start on the tile and then you also have the uh, shape of the tile for that uh, or, or the shape of the stone for that particular tile you do have the very nice glass piece uh, that, that my pieces are not actual glass they are hard plastic but you do have an option to get an upgrade for actual glass pieces that are going to be housed in this very nice cloth bag that has artwork all around it. You do have a wooden player uh, first player piece, again deluxe component as the retail component is just going to be this cardboard tile. And uh, then you do have a piece here for the solo game. Each player is also going to have their own pan. Mine is dual recessed on this. I don't know if that is a deluxe upgrade or not. Uh, but then you also have the different player boards that are going to come in two different pieces. You'll put them together like a puzzle, like so. And uh, you do have these wooden uh, chunky meeples that represent the different characters that don't just act as uh, meeples, they act as uh, telling you how many pieces of glass you've collected throughout the course of the game. And these are dual recessed as well. Again, that might be a, a deluxe component upgrade. I'm not 100% sure. There are, are, there are also extra stones that you're going to add into the game if you are playing at the higher player counts in this one, but you'll leave these out when playing in the lower player counts. Now, let's talk about how this game is going to work. How this is going to work on your turn, you are going to have up to five pieces of glass here on your uh, board. You start the game with three, so we'll go ahead and draw three out of the bag, placing them on our board here. Now these glass pieces are going to come in different colors, but they're also going to, going to come in different shapes. So looking at the player board here, you're going to see that there are eight different colors in the game, and as you can see, there are going to be uh, those that are very common and those that are very rare. White and pink are going to be the most common, while orange and yellow are going to be the most rare. And uh, they come in different shapes as well. So you've got a pentagon, uh, something that looks like a rhombus, I think, uh, something that looks like a guitar, if you ask me, uh, an oval, a triangle, and a heart. And so as you can see with the pieces that I have, I have two ovals and uh, a guitar. And so with the pieces that I have on my turn, I have two choices to make. The first is, is that I can gather glass from the river. Now when I do that, I take one of my pieces, I find the matching tile with the shape. So this is the guitar, as I keep calling it. And this is the tile that matches that. Now, I would place this piece on that tile, and then I can select either of the adjacent tiles and take all the tile, uh, all the pieces of glass that are on those. So maybe I take these two right here, and then I'm going to place them on my board. 
Now looking at my board, I have several different columns here to put my pieces of glass. And uh, each column can only hold one color, and when I have multiple pieces of different colors, I choose the order in which I want to put them in, and that might be dependent upon the common, uh, common or rarity of the, the pieces. Uh, and so maybe I put the turquoise one there and the uh, purple one there. Now from this point forward, if I were to get any more turquoise, they would have to go in this column, and same thing with purple in this column. The other columns are going to be reserved for the other colors. What am I trying to do with these pieces of glass? Well, I'm trying to complete rows because as far out to the right that I go increases the number of victory points I get. If I can get all the way to the right, I get 22 points and that's true for every row. Oh no, I lost all my glass. Um, and so what that means is, is that if I were to fill up this complete bottom row, I'd get 22 points. And then if I fill up the next row, I'd get 22 more points. That's pretty nice. Now, also in addition to that, what I'm also trying to do is I'm trying to make two columns be as high as I can, but I'm wanting them to be more on the right side of the board because that's going to give me the, the highest value. So uh, maybe let's fill up the rest of this board here, putting in more colors. And as you can see, uh, I now have all the colors that I want. Now, there are eight colors in the game, but I only have seven rows or seven columns. And so if I get the eighth color, that's not great because that's going to go into my overflow, which is on the other side of the board here. And I would have put it up here. And as you can see, those are going to be negative three points per piece that goes into this. That's also going to happen if I get more than five of any one color. If I were to get a sixth one of white, let's say, then that sixth white piece is going to go into the overflow and cost me three points as well. And again, I'm wanting to beef up these columns on the right, not the ones on the left, because at the end of the game, you get the points for the two highest columns, but if they're ties, then you're going to break the tie by the columns that are furthest to the left. So in other words, let's say I beef this one up to three right here, this light green one, but unfortunately I have uh, let's say the turquoise and the purple all the way up to three as well well it's gonna be these two that would count not my turquoise one because it's the furthest that's to the left when you break ties like that and so that's how the points are going to work in this game let's come back to the main board though to finish out how this is going to work so I'm putting that one back there we'll put that one back there and boom boom so uh, looking back at the board I placed on this tile here I took the two that were on this tile here and we're going to now flow the river. We're going to remove this tile, putting it at the back, and we're going to advance all the rest of the tiles forward, putting this one at the very back, and we'll draw from the back and place, again, the number of stones shown on the tile. So here we go, two on that one right there. And now that's the next player's turn. So as you can see, by placing the ones that are on my pan out here in the river, I'm increasing the number of stones that are available for the next player to pick on their turn, but I am taking some off of, uh, I'm, pick, I'm taking a tile and taking all the ones that are on that tile out. So that's how the river is going to move. Now, if I had two stones that were the same shape, let's say I had these two ovals here, I could take both of those and place them on any tile out here in the river. And uh, let's say I place them right there. And then I could again so select adjacently taking all the tiles. So that's how you can select anywhere in the river when you have two, uh, two pieces of glass that are the same shape. Now I mentioned there are two things that you could do on your turn. The second thing that you could do on your turn instead of placing a stone out here in the river and selecting from the river, I could take pieces from the lake. Now you have to take four pieces from the lake, but you can only hold at a maximum of five here in your pan. So you really only want to take from the lake when you have one or no pieces left here in your pan, because if you're taking from the lake when you have two or more, then those extra pieces you take have to go into your overflow. So you don't want to do that. So looking at what's available here in the lake, I would select any four of the pieces that are out here, putting them in my pan, and then we would refill the lake drawing from the bag. Uh, and that's pretty much the gist of what you'll be doing on your turn. You'll use your little meeple guy here to keep track of how many pieces you've collected. When a player gets to 17 pieces, that's going to trigger the end of the game. You'll finish out that particular round getting back to whoever is the start player, and then everybody will get one more turn, and then the game will end. At that point that the end game is triggered, you'll make sure that everybody has at least three pieces in their pan, and if they don't, then they draw from 
from the back until they do have three pieces, and then you'll start that end game process that I just described to you. You'll add up the points again, getting points for completed rows, or as far over to the right for each row that you've done, giving yourself the points, and then your two highest columns anywhere on the board, again, breaking those ties by the ones that are furthest to the left. After you've added up all those points, then you'll determine who has the most to be the winner and subtracting the negative points from the overflow. Now, I do want to talk real quick about the solo game because on the backside of each of these boards are going to be the rules for the solo game. And uh, you do have five different opponents that you can play against and they all play incredibly different and they all have differing degrees of difficulty. And so it's a little too much for me to go over in just this portion of the video, but just know that the solo game plays very similar to what I just described to you. You play exactly the same as you would in a multiplayer game. You'll just follow the directions for each of the different opponents that you play against and just know, again, they come in differing degrees of difficulty and it is highest score wins. So you do have to try to beat the, the opponent in this uh, solo version of the game. And there you have it. That's how you play River Valley Glassworks. Now let's go, go back up top and share our thoughts on this one. And we're back, and now we're gonna share our thoughts on River Valley Glassworks from a gamer and non-gamer. So Sam, the first thing I wanna ask you about this game, and it's the first thing that caught my attention with it is the table presence with this one, because you have those sliding uh, translucent river tile pieces, very much like the very first game we ever reviewed here on Love to Hate, which was Niagara, a 2004 game, kind of one of our holy grail games, hard to get kind of game. Um, but it had the same concept, these river tiles that were yeah. being pushed down the river. Um, and so on those tiles, you've got these glass pieces that sort of look like glass and you yeah. can get the ultra deluxe this is the deluxe version but it's not the top of the line because you can get the actual glass pieces in this game these are just plastic pieces in this oh. um that have real weight the glass yeah. pieces are heavy uh, but anyhow i thought it looked beautiful out yeah. on the table what did you think about that yeah it definitely as soon as i saw it thought of niagara yeah um and and a little bit of azul as well which okay. are two of our favorite game yeah so. yeah yeah now you mentioned azul and i and that's another aspect that i wanted to bring up in this game because it has a azul like uh feels to it what did you think about that yeah i mean it has the drafting and the organizing in specific mm -hmm. ways and uh i mean azul is always going to be in my top 10 games so anything that's similar to that is probably going to work well yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's got that restrictiveness of how you can place things on your board after you've drafted it, right? Yeah. Like, because that's how Azul was. You could only place these tiles in certain spots. But with this, it's, you know, the colors that you're trying to line up and, and that aspect of needing to get the most colors towards the furthest right of your board. What did you think about that? Just how it all works? Is it too restrictive or is it nice blend for you? It's definitely a little restrictive, um, but I think it's just one of those games where you have to kind of play it once and, mm -hmm. and fill it out and figure out your strategy a little bit. Um, because it, I think I did have a Zool in my head when I'm drafting and stuff, yeah. and it isn't like that. The strategy is different. So. Okay. Now, I do think that this is a game that does have some luck involved in it, but I also felt like Azul and other games similar to that have a similar degree of luck in yeah. the sense that, you know, you're you're burdened to whatever is out there available for you to draft when it's your turn, right? Like you can't do anything about the fact that somebody gets something on their turn and it's not available for you on your turn. Yeah. And that's just an aspect of drafting games, right? But there is that degree of luck that it could be that somebody just gets the exact thing that they need every time it's their turn. Yeah. And that's just the way that it is. And you might walk away from that feeling like, well, that game's not great because you got everything you needed. I never got what I needed. But that's not going to be the case every time you play this game, or at least I don't think that is the case. So what did you think on that regard as far as luck playing a factor in what you could draft out? I mean, it, yeah, but it wasn't like so luck dependent that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know. I feel like there it was... It didn't ruin a, the game. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of how I felt about it too. I could see a case in which somebody just doesn't want to play this kind of game because of that aspect yeah. though. But I think you got to give the game enough of a chance, play it a few times to see that it, you, there are going to be some games that might go that way, but there's definitely going to be lots of games that don't yeah. go that way. So, um, 
But I felt that the mechanics of this game, that you know, you're, the different shapes of the pieces determine where you can draft from, gave you enough options that you always felt like that there was at least something you could get out of the river that was gonna help you to yeah. a certain degree. Sometimes you maybe take something that hurts you a little bit, gives you too much of one color, for instance, but at least it fills out a row, right? Yeah. Or it gives you enough of a good thing to want to go ahead and take that bad thing. I thought that was a fun aspect of the game. So t talk a little bit about what it was like trying to wrap your mind around how to do well in this one. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I definitely think it's one of those games where you need to play it more than one time. Um, I think my goal <clears throat> the first time was just to get rose completed complete and rows. i wasn't as focused on who, which one is my tallest and mm -hmm. then realize that that kind of that matters too. yeah that mattered probably a lot more than i thought it did yeah well i think you could probably you know go too far one way or the other because yeah. i found the first few times i was playing i was just trying to beef up my my last ones yeah. if i could but not completing those rows and you you might win but you probably won't yeah. win. you really need to balance both of those things out to do well yeah. i think Okay, real quick, let's do our bullet point pros and cons. So what are the highlight positives with this game? I mean, it's a pretty game. Yeah. It's, it has great mechanics and great... Uh, components. Components. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I do like the Azul, you know, type of game. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think that it's really pretty. It was, it was easy to play. It's not yeah. a difficult game. No. Um, it's just maybe you need to kind of have a plan for your strategy to win the game. Yeah, I think I think it's a game that, uh, and this could be a con, I suppose. It's a game that has quite a few pitfalls in it that if you, if you start playing poorly early on, that it could really kind of mess you yeah. up and you might not be able to catch up later on, right? Like if I start, if I just get so many whites early in the game because white's the most common, I'm probably not going to do well in the later portions of the game because white's going to be out there so yeah. frequently. So there's chances for people to make mistakes in this one. Um, any, any other things maybe that you would consider cons? I mean, very nitpicky. I think the two blues are yes. very similar. Yeah. I feel like they could have thrown like a pink in there and the orange and the yellow yeah. are a little similar. Yeah. Um, but again, that's very nitpicky. It is clear the, what is what. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, I 100% agree with you on the, on the, it's either the two, bl I think it's the, the, the light blue and the light green yeah. are so yeah. similar that you grab it. And a lot of times it's like, Oh, that's yeah. not the color I thought it was. And I yeah. put it back. Like I had that happen yeah. several times. They almost need like a, maybe a black or a... Well, they do have a black. Oh. It's one of the modules that, or not a module, it's one that you play when you're playing with higher player oh, counts okay. in this game. So there is a black stone that yeah. you would add to the game, but only at the highest player yeah. counts. Maybe they could have like put some speckles yeah, in it or some yeah, other something. way to differentiate between that. I think yeah. it's turquoise. So just pay attention. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that. I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, we mentioned the luck factor. That could possibly be a con for this one. I think a, one of the strongest pros with this game is it feels like a, a fuller game at only 25 minutes. Yeah. This is a, this is a ultra quick, and I shouldn't say ultra quick, but it's a quick game, but it feels like it's maybe a meatier game than what you're probably typically experiencing yeah. at that 20 to 30 Especially minute range. Size, yeah. Like. And that's the thing about all play. All play really specializes with those kind of games. And I think this is is the perfect kind of game for all play to to put out there to the world so um, if you like all plays uh, blend of games then you're definitely gonna like this one is kind of what I feel like yeah. so all right let's get to our score so River Valley Glasswork scale of 1 to 10 where's this one come in at for you um, I'd probably give it a 7.3 7.3 okay all right I'm a bit higher on this one. I like this one quite a bit. This could possibly be in a top 10 video for me. Um, and I want to play it more. Um, it could also, I'll be fully honest with you guys, I played this out a lot on BGA, and so I knew I liked the game, and then the Kickstarter happened, and I backed it and all of that. 
and I do have a, a deluxe version of it. And so it could be the fact that I've played it a lot and, I've, and I like the way it looks and the deluxe factor, the components and everything. That could influence me here. But I like the game to the point of maybe an 8.2. I don't know. I really like this one. So um, I enjoy it. I want to keep playing it. want to keep getting it out to the table, show it to people who haven't played it yet. So um, could be a top 10 one for me as far as casual and non-gamer games go. So... River Valley Glassworks from All Play. Leave us some comments down below. Let us know what you think about this one. Make sure to like and subscribe and push that bell button so you get notifications of all our new content. I'm Lance. I'm Sam. And we are Love to Hate, where we try to bridge the gap between gamers and non-gamers. We'll catch you next time.